Hello there. So we are going to continue where we left off with the previous video. So an amendment to that. Well, we were looking at a different way to create our 3D meshes by using line art. So what we've done is created some line art vector graphics as fonts or as actual line art and we'd exported these whoops or save as did I do a CDG yeah scalable vector graphics format we can use different ones but scalable vector scalable vector graphics format export to that cancel and then we can import that directly into blender using import where we have scalable vector graphics as an option and that brings in just a flat plane so to make this workable what we need to do is play around with some settings because it's essentially a Bezier curve in Blender. This is converted to or interpreted as a Bezier, a mesh that's uh, constructed from a Bezier curve. So what we can do with that is if we just want to thicken it, and this is the amendment from yesterday or the addendum, if we just want to thicken the plane, let's use the green one because that's the plane, we can use the solidify modifier. So modifiers solidify and it'll automatically solidify the modifier. It'll automatically solidify the mesh the plane. But if we want to do something else to this, for example, we were trying to bevel this yesterday and it ended up causing all sorts of problems. Whoops. Ended up causing all sorts of problems in this area where the mesh uh, concave. Is that concave or convex? Concave. And it, it creates this shape that when we bevel, it means we're altering the structure of the mesh to add more structure to it, which tends to cause these sorts of areas to collapse and that's because we were using the bevel modifier so we're in object data properties for the Bezier curve we were using the bevel modifier that was causing that to happen so to avoid this if you want to make the object thick and have some sort of bevel what you have to do is get rid of the modifier because it doesn't like it's still a bit iffy there but it doesn't like the fact that there's a modifier there because in our object data properties we've got different settings that we can use If we reduce the structure, we reduce the probability. Let's just enable wireframe. We reduce the probability of the mesh collapsing in on itself in these tricky areas. Because it kind of starts to fold back on itself. But as we can see, this has thickness as well as the bevel. So it adds that as soon as you add bevel depth. But we can also extrude our object. And one of the differences here with using the, if we use these settings, uh, the Bezier settings above modifier settings let's just do a 
So that's got the modifier assigned to it. Let's make that twice as thick. Just enable wireframe again so we can see what we're looking at. So you note the difference between the two. The bevel modifier tends to function uh, omnidirectionally in one direction only. So it'll extrude the face downwards or upwards if it's a negative value. Whereas object properties, it changes the shape uniformly. So on both sides, so we the whoops the origin point typically remains center of the mesh. So that's just a little thing to watch out for when you are using scalable graphics or Bezier curves. It just reduces the amount of editing that you might have to then do to the mesh. So on this side, we've got the modifiers. On this side, we've got object data properties for our Bezier curve. So let's, you can see then that you can add, if you add depth to something that's already been extruded, it adds, it adds even more depth. So that's like a big, that's a heart shaped settee. We can change the resolution. But just be careful with shapes like this that you don't add too much structure. But that's what we're going to use for this exercise, this mesh. So what we want to do first, that was just an uh, addendum to what we were doing yesterday. Because we were causing that mesh to collapse in the corner there because we had the modifier and the bevel option, or we were trying to use both of them and it doesn't work very well. So what we're going to do then is use the green one as our object that we're going to get into I'm view as an accessory, but we're going to animate this with a shape key. So first we have to set this up. Let's just hide these items. So it's that one, that one, that one, that one. Let's hide that. We don't need it. What we're going to do is just convert this to a mesh. So just move it to the center of the grid. So that's what we want detail wise. That's OK. So to convert, select the object, object, convert to, and then mesh from curves. So click that, and all the properties change. What we have now is an actual mesh. So we can just do a quick bit of editing for this to get it set up for IMVU. So edit mode, switch to vertex select. What we want to do is select this vertex right at the very tip, whoops right down here, because what we're going to do, where's the 3D cursor gone? We're going to move this to that point, because what we want to do to make this as easy as possible to manipulate and uh, change the shape, we want to make sure that the origin point, which is actually this little orange dot here, that is at that cursor. Uh, well, it'll be at the cursor. So we need to select that. And then it's, uh, is it mesh? 
yes. Cursor to selected. So the cursor has jumped from there to there. So what we can do now is back out of edit mode into object mode. The cursor remains in place. And then all we do is object set origin origin to 3D cursor. And if we watch the widget, we'll see it moves to this location. Object set origin, origin to 3D cursor. So what we can do now Uh, we should be able to do this in object data properties. Yes, object properties rather. So object properties, our object is selected and we can just move this. Left click slide or click type. Click type. Whoops, click type just to make sure. And then what we want to do is rotate it upright. So we can hold control key down to snap to the increments or we can type. Once we've started the tool, we can type a value 90, press enter. So that's the shape upright. We don't have to worry about this overlap. So that's our shape. And what we're going to do now is unwrap this. What we might need to do before we do is double check shade smooth. All right, so that might mean that object data properties, normals, not quite sure why. That's weird. So we've got a hard edge around here, which we shouldn't have. And in edit mode, We'd normally be able to see that because we have the edge tags, the tags that we can assign to things. So if these were marked as sharp, whoops, let's just double check. Oh, that's why. So our edges aren't joined together. That's why we've got the hard edge. See how that splits. So what we have to do, we have to unify the mesh or we can use this for UV mapping. So because this is, if this is a happy accident, it's going to assume going to assume so that's just the G key. Yes, so that's detached. So the whole the whole of the bevel, so all of this is detached or it's not joined to the heart. And we can use this for our UV mapping because what it'll do, so let's go back into object mode double check we have a material which we do so we can rename this heart square brackets so that's heart space square bracket zero close square brackets we need to use nodes so click on the use nodes button that's the preview we just need to complete the material just to get the basic thing set up. So shading properties. There's our heart. So add texture. 
image texture. So this is just a standard basic material. And then what we can do again is either click new to create a new image, new generated image, or we can click open and that'll go to our folder where we can just select an image. So select, open, then link the two together. So color output, base color input. So left click drag. And there is the image on our object. So that's the material setup. And it's using the default UV map that's generated by Blender. So what we can do now is switch to UV editing. Now this is where this edge split comes in handy. And it's probably the same on the other side. Let's just double check. Select loops, edge loop. Yes, it is. So what we can do here, select all. So that's what we've got. We want to change that. Then UV, just unwrap. And it produces, oh, that's a very strange shape. So down at the bottom, we have the unwrap properties box. Open that. Let's try conformal. That's producing some very weird shapes. So we might have to exit edit mode, check the scale values. So scale 2020, 20, 20. okay. So this may or may not fix this. Object, apply, rotation and scale. So if we watch what happens to these values when we activate that, They all flip to zero. So let's try unwrapping this again. That's a little bit better. But yesterday what we did, what it's done, it's separated. Is that the back? That's the back. But the front has gone a bit wonky. So that means it's stretching the textures. So yesterday or in the previous video, what we did was used cube projection. So this isn't necessarily the best way of doing this. This is just for the from the point of view of if you don't if you're intimidated by Blender's options. These are things that you might do. So Q projection, these are things that you might do just to produce something that'll work in IMVU with as little effort as possible. So this is sectioned the UV map Oops. Let's choose a different texture so that we can see how. So we're going to replace this. So click on the folder icon. Let's see what we've got. So we might have to use that checker at the top. Yes, yeah, so let's just use this checker image. So beanie. It's wider, but that doesn't really matter because, so let's open and assign that. So that's what it's done. Back to UV editing. 
or we can do again make sure everything is selected UV unwrap cube projection whoops what we might want to do actually with this seeing as this didn't work So this separation didn't work in this particular instance. So what we want to do, select all and mesh, clean up, merge by distance. This is now remove doubles and it'll join all those elements together, merge by distance. So now It won't select the loop because we've got an interrupted edge flow because these faces are all split. But we can select a few of them, shift click, and see how that now moves as a unit. So select all. Let's do that again. UV cube projection. It'll probably change the distribution and the way the UV map has been unwrapped. Oh, it didn't. That's all right. But what it has done, we've now got a front and a back. And then, of course, we've got the sides. So which side is that? That's that side. That's that side. So that'll be the top. That's probably inside somewhere. Yep, that'll be inside the mesh. That's on the other side. Don't know where that one is. So that's a cube projection. For a shape like this, though, what might work better, because what you're trying to avoid as well, so although you're trying to reduce the amount of work that you might have to do, because, you know, Blender is confusing, blah, de, blah, de, blah, blah. What you might have to do with things like this is limit how many splits or how many UV sections you create. So we've got whoops, one on the front, one on the back, and then these edge sections. So we've got a number of edge sections, which is going to make painting or texturing this object quite tricky. So for something as simple as this, a better solution so we're in edge selection is to select the middle loop around the entire mesh so just select one edge select loop edge loop and that'll select the loop around the entire mesh oh that must be the bottom of that section that's all right. And then what we can do from the edge menu, drop in a seam, mark seam. So that highlights that entire edge loop as a seam. And then what we can do select all just unwrap normal unwrap and hopefully this will work whoops okay so let's do um
that should work. I wonder why that's not working. I wonder if it's because... So let's just double check something. Yes, it's because of this inner, inner section, which should, oops. So this is one of the downsides of trying to take shortcuts to make meshes, because you aren't in control of the object as it's being generated, you aren't in full control over it. These sorts of things occur that you have no control over. So now, even though we were trying to save on the amount of work that we were actually wanting to do, now, because we were taking shortcuts, we've actually got extra work to do whoops, to try and solve this problem. Because the mesh has collapsed in on its whoops collapsed in on itself at this point it's just this area that's causing this problem so because we were trying to take a shortcut like i say this is the kind of stuff that happens we've also got an error in this triangle here so we have to find a way of sorting those out in order to proceed so because all of this matters, not just from the point of view of just uh, editing the mesh and just constructing it. If we don't sort this out now, it'll cause problems later on when we come to animate. So what we've got to do now is literally just get rid of these faces. So we now have to do some mesh editing, which is what we were trying to actually avoid doing. So choose your poison, as they say. If you're not going to be too bothered about the appearance of your mesh, then these sorts of things don't matter. But if you are concerned about the appearance of your mesh, then it's best not to take shortcuts. So we're going to delete these. And now we have to do a little bit of mesh editing to tidy this up. I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. Well, the simplest way, we're going to switch to Vertex Select. So if, if this was presented to moi, and this was a problem to be sorted out, this is literally what you would do. Uh, where is it? Merge, there we go, at center. So we've got that one there, that one there. So those two. Do the same with the center. So we can see that we're actually now having to do more work because, again, we're trying to save some time. So now, oops, select that vertex, that vertex, delete those.
So we can join those two. Whoops. At center. Same on the other side. Get rid of those two. So it's crumpled it a little bit, but what we can do is select that vertex. Just do a little bit of mesh shaping. And you wouldn't even notice. So of course we've got to get rid of this lot. All this mess. And there's usually quite a bit of it. View frame selected. Whoops, can't get close enough, so view sidebar. Whoops, view. Wrong way. There we go. So now we can scroll in to see what's going on here. So we've got a set of vertices that are causing, let's unhide those faces that we had hidden. Let's go into proper view. So again, this is a consequence of trying to take shortcuts. So for all intents and purposes, it looks as if there's only a single vertex there in terms of how the structure of the mesh is set up. But as we zoom in, select view, frame selected, we can see that there are a lot of vertices there that are causing very tiny faces. We need to clean these up. So all we need to do for that is just do what we've just been doing, where we've selected the vertexes, frame selected again. So shift click and all we're going to do is just merge them together at center. And that solves that problem. I have to do the same on the other side. So ordinarily, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem, except for meshes that are going to be animated with shape keys. We need to clean the mesh up before we start doing that. Right, so we've got some holes in the mesh. We need to fill these. So select the vertices. We just want these three because we're going to create a face or an edge down the center. So select those three. Uh, vertex. New edge face from vertices. That creates a face. Same again on the other side. That just closes that gap. Let's switch the widget to make this a little easier to see. Just do a little bit more editing. Switch to scale. So that's our 
completed heart from a mesh point of view. So, as was being said, yes, you can take shortcuts and use our SVG file. Let's just save this file. Save as six, seven. You can use a line art file, but again, because you don't have control over the way that that's then converted or interpreted as a mesh structure in Blender, it can inadvertently cause more problems than it's worth you just creating the mesh from the get-go. So you have to be aware of that kind of thing occurring because what we'll also need to do now as well is just double check face orientation. That's all right, everything's the right way around. Check our smoothing. That's all right. We've got a hard edge down this center. And then we've got this problem face on this side. It's been caused by, that's a shading error. So there's an issue with the mesh somewhere. So what we want to do, by default, objects are drawn two-sided, so we can disable that in materials, and this helps us determine whether our faces are pointing the right way or not. Edit, select all, I'm going to rim doubles again, so clean up. Merge by distance. So we can set the property for this. Merge by distance pop up. Oops, that's a bit too aggressive. So what's causing that then? I have to sort these problems out because an edge? No. Not sure what's causing that, so let's try let's see if we can unwrap this now without it causing problems. So all of this was literally just a consequence of not being able to unwrap the object that we created based on the way that the mesh was auto-generated using the tools that uh, modified the Bezier curve. So had we stuck with just doing a box map Let's just upright this. Had we stuck with just doing a box map, we could have easily got a texture and a UV map created from doing, uh, from unwrapping this as a box map. But that then makes the, if this is a derivable item, or if this were to be a derivable item, you have to keep in mind that the way that you unwrap your objects has to accommodate the driver and how easy the texture is then for them to texture. So if we had 
So we could do it with this actually. It's still Bezier. Oh, we'll have to convert that. So object convert to mesh. So if we do a Q projection, so we've got one side, two sides, which is okay. But as we found previously, we've then got to edit the map. Oh, so that's going to be in. Oh, there's there's the bottom. We've now got to edit the UV map in a way that's going to be helpful to the driver, because what we don't want is to have these sections that we're editing now to be whoops discombobulated because if someone were to want to write some text around the edge of this shape they're going to have a hard time matching up how the text is supposed to fit across a jigsaw puzzle basically so that's the bottom. So what we have to do is make sure that select that face at the bottom. So that UV is at the top of the mesh. We need to manipulate the bottom. Because we need to match these two edges together in the UV map. So we have to select that island and flip it around. So all of this, and that joins it together, so it automatically joins it together. So all of this is consequential of trying to save time. By not learning how to use the application so that's automatically joined that whoops so that's one half So that's the bot that's the bottom face. We're missing a bit. Oh no, we're not. That's joined that. So we're creating a long strip. Might have to do this in a three parter. Because all of this discussion is important, but it's often not discussed. So that's that side. So that must be on the other side. Yep. So we have to flip that. now it's all joined so now we've got one solid section all the way around and again as was discussed in the previous video we can either make it fit 
one-to-one -one within the texture space that we've got. What's that extra space in the center there? It's probably there. So again, even with something like this, so that this mesh doesn't have any bevels, but we've got the same problem again. We've got this collection of vertices that we have to collapse together in order for this to UV and wrap properly. Because again, if we're going to morph this using uh, morph keys, we need to sort these problems out now Otherwise, it'll cause issues. So we have to select all of these and it'll disrupt the UV map. Mesh. Merge. Where is it? At center. Both sides. So shift click. Mesh, merge, at center. Oh, so we're okay with that. That didn't cause too many problems. Here's a trick. So if we keep the alignment perpendicular to the space that we've got available so everything's at right angles and the right way up these are relatively small in terms of the area texture area that they occupy so what you can sometimes do is rotate them which will allow us a little bit more room to scale the UV map to make it slightly larger. So let's just rotate that one, drop it on top. It's not much, but it can help sometimes quite significantly. Of course, that does mean the person deriving from this has to write their text at an angle. So you can either increase the texture density, so that's the amount of texture space that's allotted to each of the sections, or just keep it easy for people to derive from and just keep it upright. But again, all of this is a consequence of shortcuts, trying to take shortcuts, and the things that happen as a result that you don't actually have total control over. So let's get back to what we were doing. Let's save this actually so that we have a copy. Try and figure out what's going on with this mesh. There shouldn't be a sharp edge around there. And the vertices aren't splitting the mesh. There is no modifier, no edge split modifier assigned.
and the normals auto smooth is also disabled and yet we still have a hard edge around here around this edge loop that shouldn't be there but let's see if we can unwrap this so UV editing select all and wrap again so what that's done okay so do that again unwrap change to angle based and it's still a bit squiffy so exit out of that That scale is okay. Shading. Got the right material. So what we might have to do is just manually we shouldn't have to do this at all but there's probably something in the mesh that's causing issues for blender but with an object like this we can produce A UV map that's much easier to work with just basically splits the mesh in half so if it distorts like that so let's do that again and wrap if it distorts like this you can often fix the problem by just selecting the UV map and rescaling the UV and it's usually by about 50% because by default Blender is attempting to unwrap objects to a square texture so if this texture is wider than a square it'll fit it to the width or the height doesn't matter which it'll fit it to one of the uh, to the longest extreme which causes it to distort depending on the ratio of height to width Oh, hi, Chops. I've just seen your message. Uh, just meshing, meshing a heart that we will eventually animate with shape keys. But because of the way the heart was made, it's introduced a couple of issues that we've had to tidy up and sort out before we do any animation. So this is for IMVU, obviously. But we were basically talking about using line art. So if you use Adobe Illustrator or something like that that can produce line art, you can export that from the image editor as an SVG file and import that into Blender for conversion into a mesh. But as we're finding out, as we delve deeper into the process, that shortcut, so using line art instead of actually meshing the object from the get-go in Blender, that shortcut 
inadvertently causes more problems than it might necessarily be worth. So, if you're finicky about your objects, it's best to mesh them from the beginning. But if you don't care, it doesn't really matter. Right, so that is going to be our mesh. Let's just get the UV maps tidied up a little bit more. Yes, if you watch, if you watch the um, episode from yesterday or the previous video, we go over the process of using. It's basically just a Bezier curve. So if you know about Illustrator and Bezier curves, that's essentially all you're doing is creating a Bezier curve. They can be as simple as just some heart shapes. So like so. Can be as simple as that or, you know, a complicated line art. Obviously, you want to keep your shapes as simple as possible. Otherwise, you'll probably break something. But all you do is just export these it can be a font as well export these from your application of choice as an svg file you might even be able to use if you've got adobe illustrator you might even be able to use that the the dot ai format because i think blender understands that but you then can import that directly into blender as a bezier curve that you can then convert to a mesh. Right, so that's our UV map. We'll leave it at that. And oddly, that iffy face has disappeared. So it must have been something weird going on there. And we've also lost that hard edge. So there must have been some weirdness going on there. Not sure what was causing that. So that's the heart. So we've spent an hour just going over that, sorting that out. Let's just save this, save as nine. So that's the heart that we're going to animate. So the next step would be to import that into the accessory file. Oh yeah, it's, um, I mean, notwithstanding the fact that IMVU was built around 3D Studio Max, so you're dealing with all the idiosyncrasies of that pairing. Blender will pretty much now just do just about anything that Max can do for IMVU. Obviously, there's still the idiosyncrasies that you've got to work around. Right, so let's just rename this, actually. So what's that called? We call it heart. So we're going to use... We can either use the outliner, so that's our object selected, or object properties, either or. So we can double click on the listing in the outliner. Let's call this heart.mesh. Or we could have just clicked and typed in there as well. Save this again just over the top because an accessory what we're going to do is just an animated accessory so it's going to spin so it'll spin and then it'll it'll beat but the spin will be an armature or bone skeletal animation and the beating will be shape keys or morph targets as you would call them 
Right, so accessory file. Where's the accessory file gone? Oh, there it is. So that's the accessory file. Each of these objects sticking out represents a bone of the armature, uh, the skeleton of the avatar. There are two bones for each one. Attachment root and attachment node. These don't move, so their position is where they are used. So you don't do anything to these. All you do is import your mesh and position it with respect to the bone or where you expect the mesh to appear. Let's just hide all this text for the moment. So for that, we're going to use append. So file, append. Click on that. Gives us the file browser. We need to browse the file that we were just working on. Heart nine. So double click. In this mode, the files act like zip archives, archive files, so we can drill down into their contents. We want the object folder. Double click. And there is our heart.mesh. So select, append. So nothing appears to have happened, but we can check this. In the outliner, we've got a new entry appearing. But we can also view frame selected. So we were doing this before to focus on those errant vertices. So if we select that, it'll zoom in to our heart and there it is very tiny inside oh it's inside the bone but because it's selected well we can select it again so select all we need to do now is scale it up so switch to scale I've just click drag and scale or we can type a value so let's type 50 that's a bit small so we can hit backspace that'll clear the values let's type 100 there we go that's better enter that fixes that and then for today all we're going to do is just position this ready for rigging and animating which we'll do in the next episode because it, it needs a dedicated discussion on its own right so let's just move this into position above the avatar's head like so and note that it's brought it in with the material. So all of that set up. Which we can replace. I don't have a replacement for the oh hang on. Maybe I do. So click the folder icon. Big bow. Because we've changed the shape. We originally used the beanie, but we UV mapped to this two to one ratio, so we can use this one now. That replaces it. Back to layout. So that's the heart. So now, with that in place, we'll call it quits there because the next one will take a look at rigging the. Oh, save the file. Save as. This is number 10.
we'll take a look in the next stream about rigging this to the headbone of the avatar or female O3 master root. And the difference is if you rig this to the headbone, the heart will move whenever the avatar does. But if it's rigged to skeleton.root, it'll stay put. It'll always be positioned, subject to the animation that you add to it. It'll always be positioned directly above the avatar's head. So that's what we'll look at in the next stream. Right, so we'll call it quits there. That was quite a technical, that was a bit of a technical discussion actually more than anything because of the problems that are caused inadvertently by trying to cut corners, by thinking that you're going to save time using line art. There are things that you do need to be aware of because of the way that Bezier curves convert into mesh objects that are needed for IMVU because IMVU doesn't understand Bezier curves. It only stand, understands mesh data. So be aware of that problem that you may cause yourself by using line art, although it is a quick way of generating content. Right, so we shall see what happens in the next stream where we'll rig and animate. Yes, thanks for popping by, Chops, Cops. And uh, we shall see what happens then. Right, thanks for now, and we shall see you anon. <laughs>